What is up everybody? Welcome back to part 7 of my Marsha Clark book review without a doubt. Her book on her experiences during the O.J. Simpson trial, the trial of the century. Don't mind my voice, I'm just getting over a cold. You can pick this book up on Amazon in bookstores, anywhere books are sold. It is a fantastic read. She goes into much more detail than I go into in these videos. She talks about much more than just the O.J. Simpson trial. She talks about her own personal life things she was going through during the time of the trial as well, where in these videos I basically just go over the facts of the case from the point of view of Marsha Clark and the prosecution. So here we go, part seven. Marsha Clark starts out by talking about how the blood from the drop found at Bundy was pretty rare. Only one in every 200 people had it, and O.J. Simpson just happened to be one of those people. She talks about how the knife salesman that sold O.J. Simpson a knife a few days before the murder sold his story to the National Enquirer after testifying before the grand jury. Marsha Clark talks about how the media would disrupt this case like no other case before it. This was the first real case that had 24-7 footage. CNN was airing it 24-7, 365 at the time. Almost every news station, almost every television station in general, sports station included, because O.J. Simpson was, of course, a major, major sports star. Everybody was carrying this case 24-7. It was bringing in ratings like never before. Reporters were lined up everywhere all of the time just to get a sound bite from the defense, from the prosecution, anybody. These people couldn't go anywhere without a camera or microphone being shoved in their face. Marsha Clark talks about how the defense filed a motion to suppress evidence, which caused Nicole's sister, Denise Brown, to ask if he's innocent, why would he want evidence suppressed? The defense stated they wanted the evidence suppressed because the police obtained it illegally. Now we're at June 30th, 1994. They are before Judge Kathleen Kennedy Powell. This was before Judge Lance Ito, of course, took over the case. This is just the preliminary trial. Marsha Clark talks about how on day one, she couldn't believe that she had to argue about getting hairs from O.J. Simpson to match the ones they had found. They wanted 100 hairs. The defense offered three hairs. Marsha Clark talks about how on the July 4th weekend, on that Saturday, she drove out to Bundy and was met there by others that were working on the case. That's when they noticed blood drops on the back gate. They were shocked and wondered if and how Dennis Fung missed this when he was out there on June 13th. Marsha Clark states how she thinks the O.J. murders happened. She states that she thinks Nicole goes outside because she hears a noise, probably O.J. Simpson lurking in the bushes. Nicole sees nothing, turns to go back inside, and that's when she sees O.J. Then Ron appears and sees what's going on, and instead of running away, he tries to help Nicole and it costs him his life. She states OJ didn't have to deal with both victims at the same time. So essentially from what I gather, she thinks that OJ was already killing or had killed Nicole, then Ron showed up at the scene, and then of course OJ just couldn't let him leave seeing what he had saw. So uh, he took care of Ron Goldman as well, or Ron Goldman then tried to rush and help Nicole, and then that's what caused O.J. Simpson to attack him. Marsha Clark states, The reason detectives went to O.J. Simpson's house the morning of the murders was, bec was because O.J.'s kids were taken from their beds at Nicole's house and brought to the police station, and they wanted to inform O.J. before the media did. And when they got to his place, they saw blood drops on his Bronco. They had two choices. Wait for a warrant or jump the gate and not lose time. Of course, we know Mark Furman jumps the gate at O.J. Simpson's house. Now, my opinion, 
they probably should have waited for a warrant. Because if they did, they would have avoided so much trouble. Especially with someone, the background that Mark Furman had, and he was the one jumping the gate at O.J. Simpson's house. My opinion, that was a terrible decision to make, and that's one of the huge reasons why people think the glove and other evidence was planted at O.J. Simpson's house. They declare O.J.'s house a crime scene after the glove was found, the blood drops they saw on the Bronco, and the drops they saw that led from the Bronco to the front door of O.J.'s house, and that's what they used to get a warrant. The big question Marsha Clark wanted to know and wanted to have answered was if they were really there to notify O.J. of what happened, and where his kids were, or if they went there already wanting to investigate O.J. Simpson. Marsha Clark talks about how during the prelims, when Mark Furman was on the stand, he sounded like a model cop. Boy, would that change shortly thereafter. Marsha Clark talks about how after that, Mark Furman pulled her aside and told her about a file that a psychiatrist had on him, and in it, he stated the psychiatrist wrote things that were untrue and that he never said those things. I don't believe that for one second. I think Mark Furman was a pretty bad individual, pretty terrible individual. It's well documented that he was extremely racist, a very racist cop, just a terrible person to have on the LAPD law enforcement. But I mean, back then, a lot of those cops, and probably even still to this day, a lot of those cops um, just don't handle things the right way. You, you hear about it still all the time, and not just in LA, about the racial profiling that goes on with police in the United States. And it's an absolute terrible thing. And Mark Furman, at, in, during his heyday, was one of the worst, allegedly. At this time, Mark Furman didn't tell Marsha Clark any specifics, but did tell her it had nothing to do with this case. Marsha Clark talks about how on July 8th, 1994, the prelim judge said there was enough cause to believe O.J. Simpson was guilty of these crimes and the case would go to trial. During the third week of July, 1994, things started to fall apart already. The New Yorker ran a story on Mark Furman calling him a racist, rogue cop who planted the bloody glove at Rockingham. Uh, Marsha Clark felt that Robert Shapiro was behind this. Marsha Clark felt that Robert Shapiro was behind planting this story in the New Yorker. Marsha Clark talks about the racist things Mark Furman said to the psychiatrist that were in the file. I'm not going to go over those terms, obviously, but if you're interested, Get her book on page 109. Marsha Clark talks about in detail the things Mark Furman said to the psychiatrist. Mark Furman wanted to do an interview with Channel 7 News when the story broke about him, but District Attorney Gill told Marsha Clark to tell Mark to deny the request. Mark wasn't happy about it, but agreed to listen to them. That's where I'm going to end part seven of my Marsha Clark book review, without a doubt. Pick it up on Amazon. It's a tremendous read. Again, I apologize for my voice. I'm just getting over a fairly bad cold. It's starting to go away, though. It's very good. But my voice, still not there. But I wanted to get out this video. It's been a few days since I've posted one. Hopefully, the next time I do a video, my voice is back to normal. But definitely pick up the New York Times number one bestseller book by Marsha Clark, without a doubt. Her experiences during the O.J. Simpson trial. I'll be back soon with part eight of my book review. And I'll be back again with another Amanda Knox book review and another Wrecking Crew book review as well. The books are on either side of me. That's why I looked there. <laughs> Hope everyone's new year has started out well. Hope you all have a great day. And I'll see you again soon.